Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for today's speaker, Toya Nordington, uh, Glenn Allison, Mayama, Salia, and Delia Sofia. Um, we I'm going to be recording the presentation. So if um, in case we need an issue, we're going to record some questions and answers. We want this to be something that we will put online for the Navigating Change website. So um, this is part of the ASU Lab Navigating Change in Museum lecture series, which looks at diversity in museum practices. So those exhibitions and um, professionals in the museum world that are making change, the necessary change for the museum to be more equitable, uh, to be less racist, to be decolonized. Um, this is a, a, a free series. And in this particular occasion, we're going to have two of the fellows of the ASU LACMA program, uh, Delia Sofia Zacarias, she's a SNAP Research Fellow, and Maria Masalia, who is a program specialist at LACMA. The ASU LACMA Fellowship in Art History offers a three-year degree program uh, in order to uh, for the fellows to explore key issues around expanding the kind of art history for the future of the museum and the whole idea for fellows like Maria, uh, Mariama and Delia yeah, Sofia is that um, somehow them and all the fellows that are going to come are sort of going to be protagonists of the change a museum needs to undertake to become uh, the museum of the future. So today, uh, the speakers, Alice and Glenn, and we're going to be talking about the exhibition Promise, Witness and Remembrance to reflect on the life of Brianna Taylor. I'm going to now pass on the baton to Mariana Sofia. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. And hi, everyone. My name is Mariana Salia, and I work in the library at LACMA. I'm a second year in the ASU LACMA Fellowship Program. And I believe that Allison Glenn, who is one of our speakers, is on our and on her way. Um, but before she gets here, I will just set the stage by discussing how wonderful she is. Um, she is a curator and author, uh, deeply invested in closely working with artists to develop ideas, artworks, and exhibitions um, that respond to and transform our understanding of the world. Her curatorial work focuses on the intersection of art and public sphere through public art, biennials, special projects, and major new commissions by leading contemporary artists. She is currently a senior curator at Public Art Fund in New York City and one of the curators for Counter Public 2023, a St. Louis based triennial. She recently um, received a claim for the show that we're here to talk about today Promise, Witness, Remembrance at the Speed Art Museum in Louisville. And her previous curatorial roles include the senior curator and director of public art at the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, as well as the associate curator of contemporary art at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas. Her writing has been featured in catalogs published by LACMA, Prospect New Orleans, Princeton, amongst many others. And she received a dual master's degree from the School of Art Institute of Chicago in modern art history theory and criticism and art administration and policy, as well as a Bachelor of Fine Art Photography with a co-major in urban studies from Wayne State University in Detroit. Um, I am really excited to meet her and to hear what she has planned for us this afternoon. And before we get into that, I, oh, and she just joined us. Yay, welcome, Allison. It's nice to see you. I just, <laughs> okay. I just um, went through your, I just introduced you a bit. Um, here, I heard. Thank you. Oh, oh great. Okay. Well, on, but I heard the intro. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, welcome. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you for joining us. And before we get into your presentation, I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, Delia Sofia, um, for further introductions. Thank you, Mariama. Um, as uh, Cecilia mentioned, I'm Delia Sofia. I am based in the director's office at LACMA as the executive administrator. And it is my pleasure to introduce Toya Northington. Toya uh, MSW is an artist, researcher, and social entrepreneur. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Georgia State University and holds a master's in social work from the University of Louisville. Working in mixed media and across disciplines, Toya's work are, um, Toya's works are an act of resistance, pushing back against societal expectations. 
Northington engages in multiple strategies to promote social change and further her commitment to social justice. Among these strategies uh, are her engagement in research that seeks to improve conditions for highly marginalized populations, i.e. formerly incarcerated African-American men and women living with HIV, incarcerated older adults, and the empowerment of sexual minority youth. Her work is an acknowledgement of traumas too often experienced by women and provides a means to foster healing and resilience from them. Northington brings a unique and important feminist perspective to her work and life as an African-American working class woman. She combines her personal lived experience with her professional training and education as both an artist and a master's level social worker to produce work that is simultaneously transformative, empowering, and socially conscious. Toya is the recipient of Art Meets Activism, Artist Enrichment, and the Special Grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. In 2012, Toya founded an art-based mental health and social justice organization, Art Thrust. This was the first nonprofit organization employing art-based trauma-informed programming to address the psychosocial needs of Black girls and LGBTQ plus youth in Louisville, Kentucky. She is also currently the executive director at Art Thrust and the Director of Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the Speed Museum. Her most esteemed museum accomplishments included creative aging programs recognized by the American Alliance of Museums and E.A. Mickelson Philanthropy and the community engagement strategy for the highly acclaimed exhibition, Promise Witness Remembrance in 2021 at the Speed Art Museum. Uh, without further ado, I will pass it over to our presenters, but it, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to write them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariama and Delia Sofia, and thank you all for being here today. Sorry, I was a few minutes late. I just hopped from another Zoom. Um, also, Toya, thank you so much for being in dialogue with me today. I, I feel like our work together continues to have reverberations. And for that, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Looking forward to it. So for uh, this presentation today, um, we really thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to walk through some of the strategies that we used and ways that we approached this exhibition. I am gonna resume sharing. There seems to be, let's see if I can progress. Okay. So, um, and at any time, like either Toya or myself will really kind of jump in. So Toya, if you feel like you want to say something, please um, don't ask for permission. Um, I just, I really wanted to start this conversation by talking about the ways, the structure that the museum had set up um, to make it possible for this exhibition to happen. And when I was approached by the Speed Museum, it was an email from their former director, Stephen Riley, and it was November of 2020. It was a few days before Thanksgiving. Um, and the email basically outlined, Stephen introduced himself, I, I hadn't met him before, and he introduced the project and shared that um, he had been um, referred to me by some colleagues in the field. And he outlined what they were looking to do. And that was to exhibit the portrait of Brianna Taylor that Amy Sherald had painted. And at that moment, um, the portrait coming to the Speed Museum was really important. Um, not only for the community, but also, of course, for Brianna's family, um, the, the Speed Museum itself. And in order for this to be successful, there were key players that had to be identified and lucky for the museum, for me, for Toya, that they had already done that work. And so we were very aligned. And they basically said that Tamika Palmer, who is Brianna Taylor's mother, had agreed to participate and be a key stakeholder. And Stephen was really excited about Toya um, going from being an educator broadly at the museum to being dedicated specifically to this project. And so they shared that I'd be working closely with Toya, with Tamika Palmer and with uh, Louisville Steering Committee 
to kind of get feedback and shape what the presentation would be. And at that moment, I knew that no matter what I was going to take this project on, um, at the time I was at Crystal Bridges. Um, so I was working for another museum. I hadn't been to Louisville before. I had not been to the Speed Museum before. Um, and so there were already some kind of inherent challenges to um, understanding how to approach this as a curator from outside of the community, outside of the museum, but knowing that the Speed had set up uh, a kind of scaffold upon which uh, the presentation of this portrait could be best supported made me feel confident enough that it was it would be appropriate for me to walk into this space and um, begin to understand what my role would be in this project. It's almost like they had all the key players and they just needed the, the kind of one final piece. Um, and at that time, I believe they, they really thought it was going to be the painting. Um, but as the exhibition developed rather quickly, it became an exhibition. Um, and Toya, I'd love for you to kind of talk about your relationship to this process uh, from the inside, you know, how you were setting it up from the education team. Absolutely. Um, one of my roles is the visionary, right? Thinking about what we can do big, bold picture. Um, and a lot of time the hurdles when you look at big institutions and historically uh, white founded institutions is that fear, right? So I had to one, paint the vision of how it could move forward, you know, how it could be successful and also could it be an exhibition, right? And really support from the internal side that, you know, it, it shouldn't um, be a floating painting alone without context. It needed context for people to really understand the magnitude of what um, Amy Sherrill was bringing. Yeah, and I, I, I that's wonderful to hear too, because I remember Stephen Wiley um, talking about like contextualizing the painting and I shared that same approach. I was like, it needs to be more than just the painting for it to be successful. Um, and so some of the, is someone, could we all mute if we're um, perhaps not speaking just in case we don't have any reverb. Um, so of course, one of the key players was Amy Sherald and um, really, I can't stress enough how important the artist's voice is and was not only to this process, but also to the success. Um, much like there were key players that could make things happen. When sometimes I would invite um, Amy into dialogues to get her perspective. And because the idea of the portrait going to the Speed Museum, she was very invested in this idea and she was very, very much made it possible. Um, bringing her into the conversation was a strategy that I used at times to um, center her influence. Because often, as we know, you know you're all museum professionals or aspiring museum professionals. Um, oftentimes artists can have a kind of sway in a conversation that is really important that uh, we listen to. And so if there was a, a question about how to move forward or a concern about you know, what the best approach might be, I often turn to Amy um, and others um, and Amy could really be a guiding force. And I'm gonna play this short before I do address some, some of the key questions. So main questions I had as a curator where how does curatorial work address the site of trauma? Who were the key players? And what is the project's focus and goal? And how can we keep this in focus? And Toya, again, like I'd love for you to talk about from the speed perspective, like um, what were some of the ambitions of the project? Well, one of the things that I guess several things is we wanted to make sure we weren't causing harm. Right. Um, it was a loaded, um, very um, emotional time in the city. It was very tense. Um, but we wanted to make sure that if we were going to do this, we were going to represent the voice of community. Um, and I knew that we needed to represent Black community. Right. And if we can get that right, then the others will come along. And it really was important to do that first. And we also had to do this in concert with our board right, and staff, everyone had to be on the same accord because it was such a big feat. We couldn't take it on individually, 
it looks individual, right? You see Allison, you see myself in the front and we took a lot of it on our shoulders, but there was a whole team of staff that also had to take on extra hours and extra work and um, both emotional and physical work. So those were the things that um, were happening on the end to really navigate that process. And if that wasn't in place, it wouldn't have been possible for um, this to be successful. You know, I, I, when people ask like, how did you, how did you all do this? It's like, well, we were aligned, you know, like the museum was aligned from board to staff. Um, everyone wanted this to happen. It was, it was not a question of should this happen? It was how, um, and I wonder, Toya, do you have any strategic, um, I don't know, like insight or um, information to share about how the strategy was developed prior to my arrival? So for me, um, when Allison came in, um, I have a background in social work, as they mentioned, but um, research is my framework. And so one of the things that's really successful when we're trying to reach groups that haven't been engaged, right, usually um, communities that have been marginalized, um, in our case, Black community, we needed to know how they felt about it directly. So before the project started, um, I put out fillers in community. Hey, this is coming up. You know, how do you feel about that? Kind of indirectly, informally, right? Just to get the word out. So when um, promotions started happening, it didn't catch anyone off guard. But also one of the things I say that it's very hard to criticize something you created. And so I knew that the community directly had to be part of the creation of the work in order for them to support this, right? And it was important because um, we had to center the people that were on the front lines, not only the front lines of protest, but the front lines of change, but also the people who have been adversely affected by gun violence. Um, people said, oh, well, my family was affected too, right? My um, loved one was killed. My friend was killed. So there was a lot riding on this particular exhibition, and it was important to get um, their perspectives right um, before the planning even happened. as a city struggling to respond, to grieve, to react, to move forward following the killing of Breonna Taylor, other deaths that followed, a year of protests, an enormous spike in gun violence across the city and the country. This exhibit from the beginning has represented our attempt, like what would it look like for a museum to try to serve a city going through what Louisville's been going through to try to serve our country at a time of need. When you walk into the museum, into the galleries, on your sightline, you see the portrait of Brianna Taylor painted by Amy Sherald. It's the only thing you see. If you've come to the museum to just see that painting, you know exactly where to find it. If you wanna engage with the exhibition as a concept, you can also do that. So the intention with this placement was to make the portrait accessible, to make people feel comfortable, to know where they were, intending to go, to also understand the importance of this exhibition in relationship to the story of Breonna Taylor. The title Promise, Witness, Remembrance was developed from a conversation I had with Tamika Palmer when I asked her what this exhibition could do for her and represent for her daughter's legacy. It was also important to understand that this exhibition was meant to connect the local to the national. So when I first started on this journey, I knew where the painting was gonna end up. I knew that it was gonna be co-acquired by the Smithsonian and by the Speed Museum. And so I, I looked pointedly to how I could start that conversation between the local and national throughout the exhibition, thinking about promise, you know, so the sections, the artworks, artists. Oh, say can you see by freedom's clear light. The first section is promise, which is the promise of a nation and the symbols that the promise is meant to afford its citizens. Key things like national anthems, flags, voting rights, and the military that uphold them 
are what artists and artworks in this section look at. Hank Willis Thomas has the two works, the flags that are flanking the doors, and each star represents a person killed by gun violence in the United States in the year that they represent. That your dying. The next section, Witness, thinks not only about the curatorial framework, but also about visitors to the museum. I anticipate many will be first-time visitors. So this, this portion of the exhibition really unpacks what artists do. Artists help us understand the contemporary moment. And in this section, I've paired historical works with more contemporary ones to tell a larger story about witnessing and sometimes protesting. The muffled drums is one of the first protests or marches for black lives in the United States. And it was organized by the NAACP and then the protest photographs of Louisville, focusing on historic, contemporary, you know, timely but enduring. Remembrance is a section that looks at artworks that have been created to honor those lost to gun violence and or police brutality and their legacies. The exhibition was developed in conversation with many key constituents. I initially developed a national panel of advisors to guide the conversation from the onset. These people come from very different walks of life. They've all experienced gun violence and or police brutality, either in their families or communities, or stand in solidarity. I spent a lot of time listening to the Louisville Steering Committee and also the team at the Speed Museum. And from these conversations, alongside listening to Tamika Palmer, is how the curatorial framework developed. I'm hoping that this type of work, this type of co-creation, where we've worked with community, community has had a voice, not just a superficial voice, but a really in-depth autonomy as of the outcome that happens. I'm hoping that that becomes a new model, that institutions learn from us, that this can happen. You can work with community and make programming and exhibitions together. So at the Speed, our mission is to invite everyone to celebrate art forever. So consistent with that and also because of the nature of this exhibit, everything about it is free. Um, admission, parking, we want this to be extremely accessible for a lot of reasons. One, no one should be making money off of this experience, and we aren't. But even more so, we want everyone to come through this exhibit together Every visitor is going to be different. I'm going to have a different experience because I'm a black woman. Um, I'm at the heart of things that are happening here. So I experience it as first person. But if you have not been at the heart of what has happened here, taking that in and really understanding someone else's truth, right, through their voice, through their eyes is important, but also really reflecting on your place in that. Right? Have you been supportive of this movement? Has it been a little um, intimidating or frightening at some points? And really examining kind of uh, how we can move forward together. So I think for the rest of this presentation, what Toya and I are gonna do is really just talk about the key strategies that we used um, and the ways that we deployed them or um, relied on them um, to not only like from my vantage and my, my responsibility was developing the exhibition and Toya's responsibility was really to develop the local steering committee develop the relationships locally, make sure that they had a voice in giving feedback to the exhibition. So, um, and really that is gone. It has exploded into something completely different that Toya, I wonder if you anticipated the impact that the work that you did would have on your current role at the speed, which is very different than the title you had when you started um, and also the work that you're doing see it. You know, I'm a very strategic thinker. Um, and I knew this was an opportunity. Um, a lot of times, if you just get that in, right, you get the opportunity that when to show people what's possible. And this was all about like dreaming a bigger dream. 
And without this framework, it's hard to, um, to build that expectation that it could happen because before it was impossible, right? So once you can do the impossible, you can build on that and say, okay, what more can we do? How else can we build on it? I love that. And I think it's also really interesting too. Like um, I'm, I feel like we're similar in that I'm not really a no person until I hear no, I, I see possibility. And it's just a matter of understanding how to shape and strategically frame something till we get to a yes. Um, and then once you're in the yes and the yes is successful, you can't shy away from it. Now the speed is known for this and it's completely charted the course of how this institution is working not only locally, but also represented nationally and internationally. Um, and, and I think that really is a testament to the collaborative work um, so as I mentioned in, that, um, in the, the short video that we just shared, there were so many voices in the room and there were so many early Zooms and I was getting a lot of feedback about like what this could be. And I was having a difficult time prioritizing. And I think it's important to be really honest about that. Uh, I was having a difficult time prioritizing how to incorporate all the feedback I was getting and I wanted to incorporate it, but I didn't, I, I was still developing my own strategy and my approach. And so I did two things. One of them was I started to turn to people in my network that shared an interest that I could talk to. And those people started to become the national panel. And the first person I spoke to actually was the Astor Gates, who I'd worked for, who was a mentor of mine, who had successfully worked with the Tamir Rice Foundation. Um, and something I think I want to I want to share space with Toya on this. We knew the the risks professionally because um, we had seen very well meaning colleagues approach issues like this with less success. Um, Toya, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I tell people a lot is that um, you've seen the end, you know, the result of when it happened, but the um, magic happens through the tension, right? And real change doesn't happen unless you're really committed to that, that ugly duckling phase, that really hard, difficult part where you're just finding your feet and just going through the dark. And there were some dark days where it was like, okay, we know we're going north, let's keep walking. Come on, Allison, let's keep walking. And that's really important for institutions because we're taking on work that's uncharted, right? We are going on a journey that people have not gone through. And these kind of things give us these kind of guiding lights to say, okay, this particular method worked. We know that collaboration works when it's intentional. We know that curating and education can work in combination to community across the institution if we are intentional from the beginning. Um, so those are the kind of things that I feel helped early on. I would agree completely. Um, the second, the second person I spoke to was um, Tamika Palmer, and I, I mean, I, Toy and I spoke with her quite often during the development. But after I spoke to Theaster, he said he reminded me. He reminded me of something I knew, but sometimes you need that person to remind you of something you already know. And he said, the most important voice in the room is to make Palmer. And don't forget that. Like, and if you lose your North Star, just realign. And so after that conversation, um, I sent Miss Palmer a text. And I just was like, what does this exhibition mean to you and your daughter's legacy? Like, I need to get very clear here. And this is the response she gave me. This exhibition will continue to do what Brie has always done for us, and that is to continue to bring people together. Only this time, people are wanting to learn her story and to continue to stand for her and even celebrate some on how she changed the world. And so the three ways that she identified that Brianna had changed the world were the three sections of the exhibition. So the mark that she left upon all of us, which is like the promise, right? The promise of a life, the promise of an impact. The struggles we went and are continuing to go through to get justice for her, that's the witness section, right? Like tying it to contemporary art and artists that have also created work that's in response to struggle. And then 
the laws and policies that were changed because of the injustice that she experienced, that's remembrance. So remembering the impact of a person's life or their untimely, in this case, a extremely unfortunate and untimely death. Um, and throughout all of this, it was also important to know that many people knew the name Brianna Taylor because of the incident that took her life. But there are people who knew Brianna Taylor because they were her sister, her mother, her cousin, her boyfriend, her grandma, you know, and um, really wanting to honor that this was a woman who had a full life and people who cared about her. And it was going to be important to make sure that we were balancing and the, the steering committee gave me a lot of balance around that, which we'll get to soon. Um, but so I, I first want to talk with the national panel and then we're going to kick it off to the steering committee. Um, as I mentioned, when, uh, when I received the email and was invited to join this project, there was a, a, a local steering committee, a series of committees actually, I was told it was one, but Toya actually built four because that's who she is. Um, and they were going to give me feedback on the exhibition concept. And so I set up a kind of strategy on how to do that and a workflow. And I really just felt like um, this exhibition was so much bigger than me and my voice and kind of a traditional thesis that a curator might develop around an idea. And so um, before I even went to the local steering committee out of respect and also really out of wanting to make sure that I was going to get it right before I brought it to them, I built a panel of advisors. And these are people, they're all people that I knew. They're all people that um, I, I could call all of them friends, every last one of them. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly mention who they are and then kick it off to Toya. Um, so Mecca Brooks works in Hank's studio and um, Hank Willis Thomas is an artist. His work primarily, um, he started on about 21 years ago, started on a path, actually it's been 20, three now, started on a path because he lost his cousin Sangha to gun violence outside of a club and Sangha was his best friend and they were in their late teens, early twenties. And that was a moment for Hank where he used his practice and his studio as an opportunity to raise awareness of issues around gun violence and to honor his cousin. And it was his way of processing the pain. Mecca uh, works in the studio is also Hank's cousin and um, really gave insight as well um, as it relates to her own personal experience with gun violence and police brutality and the people she's lost. As I mentioned before, Theaster was a kind of a key person for me, a mentor, someone I could call and be vulnerable with, someone who knew me and who had successfully worked with the Tamir Rice Foundation, so had worked with a family with a high profile case that was still grieving and had successfully used his position of, um, you know, culture bearer, artist, curator, multi-hyphenate. Um, uh, the next person is John Cesare Goff. And I met John when I was working in New Orleans at Prospect 4, and that's when I first came across his work. John's father is um, uh, the, he presided over Mother Emanuel AME after the white supremacist shooting that killed nine parishioners and uh, Reverend Clementa Pickney. And John at the time was making a film about the Gullah Geechee low, co low Country, which is where he's from, and Reverend Pickney was a mentor of his. And he created a film that, um, we exhibited in the exhibition um, around the loss of the uh, Mother Emanuel Nine. And uh, it was a, a, a portrait of his community that he made to process the grieving and loss. The next person is Raymond Green. Raymond is a friend who lives in Northwest Arkansas. His cousin is Alton Sterling. So not in the art world. Um, we called him like the layperson but um, from a family that had a high profile case that could give perspective. Um, the next person is Lakeisha Leek. Lakeisha is a friend. I met her working for Theaster. She's an arts administrator, artist advocate, and her cousin is Trayvon Martin. And I, was, I knew her when her cousin was killed. And um, we had worked together to create a, um, places and spaces where she could find her voice in it. And I really wanted her to continue to um, find that voice and advise on this project. Of course, I mentioned Hank. Amy was really intrinsic to the panel because she had created the portrait. She was driving a lot of how the, it made, how the exhibition was made possible. 
And then Dr. Allison K. Young, who is our, an art historian who teaches at Louisiana State. Um, Allison is someone that I, I wanted the real kind of, you know, someone with a doctorate, someone who's really kind of professionalized art history, looking at global contemporary art to give some input from the, um, the kind of art world perspective. So that was my panel. And these people were just like, it wouldn't have been possible without them. And I, I can give one piece of advice. It's like, find your people and like, keep them close, find your advisors and keep them close. And oftentimes they're not going to be just curators or art administrators. You know, they, they might be artists or, or come from any different walk of life. And um, Toya, just tell me how to advance when we go through these. Oh, you doing my slides now? Okay. Um, do that one and then I'll pull up. I have another slide deck as well. So um, Allison likes to tease me and it, it was kind of a running joke. How many steering committees do you have? And so uh, part of the strategy going on is really magnifying not only my voice, but the voice of black community. And so a lot of times when you have these type of projects, any type of project where you're trying to meet um, a group that's been disengaged, whether it be black community, Latino community, or any community that hasn't been um, elevated in these historic institutions, you really want to get their voice directly. Um, as an institution, we typically um, are used to making decisions, right? Calling the shots aesthetically and um, policy-wise. And so the steering committee was instituted to say, how can I get as many voices to the table as possible to inform what's happening with this exhibition, with the programming, and really the museum as a space for belonging itself. Um, and so I pulled together a steering committee that represented different walks of life, different methods, different backgrounds, um, no academic background, so say, hey, let's come together and think through how we can make this exhibition impactful. How can we make sure that the voice of the community is heard and seen and valued in what we're doing? And also, how can we make sure that we center Brianna Taylor, right, in the work and in the exhibition and keep her forward? But we needed a method to do it, right? So the steering committee was there really um, engaging in ideas and feedback and that sort of thing as a concentrated committee. But I wanted to say, how can we get collective um, Greater Louisville involved, right? How do we get the voices that are not fortunate enough to be on this committee? And that's where the research committee came in, right? So we got together way before the steering committee was actually invented or thought about and said, okay, what is it that you want to know? And really thinking about not only what did I want to know for this exhibition, but how would the information that I gained help me move the museum forward in the future? And so um, there was a community engagement survey that was the largest survey that we've done as an institution with Black community, really saying, hey, look, this exhibition is coming. What are your thoughts? These are some ideas that we have. How do you want to engage with it? Did we get this right? Where do we get that wrong? And what additional ideas do you have for us? But there was also the thought of how do we... Um, collect direct voice, right? So not us relaying back what people have said, but how can we get the voices of the people directly? And from that, we decided to take on what we call is a photo voice project. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The photo voice is a way of really capturing the voice of the people through photographs. Thank you. And um... I'll zoom through this quickly. I just want to share some, some feedback I got from the steering committee and how it impacted my decisions as a curator. And this is a way to kind of for, you know, emerging burgeoning curators or not, like how do you incorporate this kind of feedback? Because the feedback is one thing, but the actual implementation is something else. And the first point of feedback they shared with me, it was more color. Like Brianna was a very happy person. You know, we're really going to need you to think about color. And I um, loved that feedback, had one artist in my back pocket that I wanted to work with. And I feel like the steering committee gave me permission to do that. Um, 
and that was Sam Gilliam. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the wall color. So um, early in the process, I asked Tamika Palmer, I said, what were Brianna's favorite colors? And she said, Kentucky blue and purple. And because the portrait really encapsulated that blue, um, I turned to um, Adrian Miller, who's the exhibitions coordinator. And I was like, what about purple? You know, could we do a purple wall color? And she said, oh, well, the purple that we use for the Andy Warhol exhibition is actually a deep, dark purple that reads almost black. And it was like, perfect. This was another way to incorporate the personal, that's a form of a portrait in, um, you know, wall color. So, and also listening uh, to the steering committee and incorporating it in the exhibition design. And Maria Magdalena Campos Pons was another artist who um, was already working on this project, Butterfly Eyes for Brianna, and developed this very colorful triptych that came directly from the studio to the Speed Museum and then was acquired by the Speed Museum. And there were multiple acquisitions that were made by the Speed from this exhibition. Another one was that the, the steering committee said, we want more local artists. And I knew this was going to be attention because, you know, some people in the museum wanted something and then the steering committee wanted something else. It's like, how do I navigate this? I know the museum wants nationally recognized artists, but it doesn't mean that local artists can't or not are not nationally recognized. And so um, I had already incorporated some artists from the collection that were local, like Sam Gilliam. Um, and I, I said, when they said, you know, local artists, I said, great, you know, remember this is December, we're in the pandemic, we don't have vaccines yet, it's snowing, I couldn't get to Louisville, so all of this is like via Zoom, and I said, wonderful, what about photographers, do you have photographs from the protest movement, can you recommend some artists, and so they built this incredible spreadsheet, <laughs> and like, 50 artists on it. And it was a very non-traditional curatorial approach. I clicked links. I like DM'd people in their Instagrams, very much like a, hi, this is who I am. You don't know me. Can you like, this person recommended you or the steering committee recommended you. And I'd love to just have a conversation about your work. And um, from this emerged a set of photographers that were included. And one thing I told myself was that I, I wasn't gonna edit the archive. So the photographs that were included were of the protests for a year and, it, and all those works were acquired by the museum. Um, one of the photographers that really is important to speak to is Tyler Gerth. Tyler was documenting the protest movement and he was shot and killed at the protests. Um, and just one example of the kind of many cases of gun violence that intersected with this particular case in this community. Um, and this is the moment where, uh, including Xavier Burel's photographs, um, where I wasn't going to edit the archive, I wanted to show what was happening. And I feel like this photograph encapsulates the moment in Louisville. And I mean, how many, there's 20 police officers on one person. So um, another, another moment to mention is um, Travis Najdi and this photograph that John Cherry took of him. Um, Travis was another person who was really instrumental in the movement and really found his voice and was becoming a leader in the protest movement. And um, in an unrelated incident, he lost his life to gun violence, a real loss for the community. And so there were these smaller moments in the exhibition that were pointing to where I, I was really trying to listen and be aware of the other issues in the community at that moment that the exhibition could speak to and how artworks could do that. And then just, I'm gonna breeze through these, but just finally, um, I really wanted to use the co-acquisition as a framework. I knew early on that the work would be co-acquired and I wanted to make connections between the local and the national. So local Louisville steering committee, national panel. Um, the works that were in the Speeds collection and how they pointed to perhaps uh, you know, this, in this case, the Spirit of Freedom, which is a full size, it's a, a public sculpture by Ed Hamilton, who is a Louisville native, a bust that Hamilton created to develop this larger sculpture that's in DC is in the Speed Museum's collection. And then of course, the connection between the painting by Amy Sherrill that's in the Speed Museum's collection and in the collection of Namak. Um, 
going to kind of breeze through witness really just wanted to share like if someone uh, oftentimes in developing this exhibition, I was thinking a lot about audiences and perhaps hoping that there would be a certain number of visitors to the museum who hadn't come before, who were coming for the portrait. And so really trying to contextualize like what was happening in this moment. So the witness section was really important. Um, and then I wanted to anchor the moment in a larger historical trajectory and did that by including this work by Terry Adkins that was pointing to the um, silent protest parade, which was down Fifth Avenue in New York in 1917. It was organized by the NAACP where 8,000 men, women, and children marched silently to protest um, a recent um, uh, kind of particularly violent summer, the East St. Louis riots. Um, and, and it was arguably one of the first organized protests for black lives in the United States. So contextualizing this historical moment with this current moment where you see the protest photographs that um, are representing and documenting snippets of the larger protest movement in Louisville. This is an image from the silent protest parade in New York. And the reason why this work is called Muffled Drums is because it was the New York Times published this photograph with a byline saying um, 8,000 men, women, and children marching to the sound of silent drums. And then finally, um, including Sam Gilliam, this was this kind of moment already existed in the archive, and it was just an opportunity for me to unearth it. And this is one of those wonderful research moments. So Carousel Form 2, which is the Sam Gilliam drape painting that is in the Speed Museum's collection, was featured on the cover of Art in America in 1970. And this is an image of the publication on the left. And of course, this portrait of Brianna Taylor painted by Amy Sherrill that is in the Speed Museum's collection was featured on the cover of Vanity Fair 50 years later. So two painters, works being featured on the cover of major circulating periodicals to talk about the state of art in America, Black art in America, the Black experience in America. Um, so a lot of resonance there. And then the final thing I'll talk about is the placement of the portrait, which again, um, Atoya, do you want to share how many first time visitors came to the museum? Was it something like 15,000? Yeah, that? something like that. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, so many people hadn't been since they were younger or little. And I love the story when you talk about the wayfinding um, to the portrait being a linear path. Yeah, it was really important um, because we all know like museums have so many barriers to entry. Some of those barriers are, where's the front door? Can I climb these stairs? Will my body, does my body do that, right? How am I supposed to act in this space? Like, what are the cultural mores? Um, can, can I afford it? Is there, like, what am I supposed to do? So all of these kind of barriers to entry really prohibit people from engaging in a space that is supposed to be for communities and publics. So really trying to peel that back. This was the vantage that you got from the door to the, what the speed calls the 1927 building, which is the original building. And so, You've already found the door. It's in the back of the museum because it's oriented to the university campus. Um, you found the door. You've entered. The admission is free. There's a lot of um, wayfinding right when you come in that shows the portrait. So there's a, a sense of comfort. And then if you've never been to an exhibition before, hopefully you hadn't been to an exhibition before, you know where you're going. So you don't have to ask someone how to get there, try to find the elevator. You can see the portrait on your sight line. And so this, this, action of positioning it was twofold. If you wanted to just go to the portrait, there were literally no barriers. You could see it from the door. But if you wanted to engage in the exhibition as a concept, you could do that too. And it was really about creating a sense of agency for viewers. And then, gosh, there's so many, so many things to talk about. I keep thinking it's ending. Um, the timeline, when I, um, I, I wanted um, a timeline in the exhibition to kind of connect the exhibition, when I shared that with the Louisville Steering Committee, they, they were like, oh, we have people we can recommend. There's some poets. I knew I wasn't gonna write it. I knew it wasn't something for me to author. And so when I brought this idea to Tamika Palmer, she said, oh, I'll write it. And I was like, this is perfect. 
Um, and so working with the graphic designer, we decided to make the font uh, a 100 point font and include it in the, the gallery that included the portrait. So if you're facing the portrait, the text is on your sides and behind you. And if the portrait is to your back, you see the text, which is essentially the timeline of Brianna Taylor's life through her mother's eyes, which I didn't edit. There were slight copy edits, but not really. And um, there was a moment where I was encouraged to write a label to contextualize what was happening in that space. And I said, absolutely not. Because what that does is that takes away the authoritative and authorial voice in this space. And it makes it the museum voice. Cause you know, like the museum voice is kind of the ubiquitous communication. And, and in this instance, the most important voice in the room was Tamika Palmer. And so it was really important to not decenter her with a label. That was a great call. That um, room was where the tears flowed. You know, the emotion built up and to go there and to read the voice of the mother, right? And hear her words and that ebb and flow of emotion, that excitement in certain periods. And to see that last moment is something that you couldn't have recreated. None of us could have recreated it um, in such a powerful way. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was floored. I, Ms. Palmer is so, she's very clear generous, gracious. Um, she was very easy to work with. Um, and I, I felt like seeing this final paragraph was the moment we all needed in the space. And um, Toya, do you wanna talk about aftercare? I, this is something that we shared the interpretation moment, but um, do you wanna kind of jump in here and talk a little bit about aftercare and then bring your slides up with regard to things that are happening further? Sure. And I'll just talk about that briefly. Um, you know, in museum spaces, we're always trying to engage, right? How do we get people to engage with the exhibitions? And this was one way um, that we brought in that voice, another way, right? Multiple layers. And so people could respond to promise, witness, remembrance. Do you have um, an image of the, the video? Which video? The next slide. Um, Black News? No. So, yes. So, this existed in the same space with um, Black News. And the wonderful thing about it is it became this impromptu community space, right? It was at the very end of the exhibition. You had to commit to it, you had to walk down some stairs to get to it. But when people got there, they gathered and they stayed there for a while and they talked and they reflected. Um, and they've seen themselves, many of them, in that video, but also doodling down their ideas. So it was a really um, refreshing place, almost like the dinner after the funeral, right, where people gather and talk and collect. Uh, and that was just a really powerful touch to the exhibition that, again, we could not have preplanned. Some things just happen right? They're the magic sauce that you couldn't plan for. And that was one of those things that just happened. Yeah. And, and I, I want to be honest here, the decision to include these two works was because there, there, were, there was noise bleed. The decision to include them here in the space was because the noise bleed from Black News would have been confronted by John Cesare Goff, um, which the tempo of uh, John Cesare Goff's film was meant to kind of bring you towards the portrait. It was a very processional, one of the steering committee members said it was like going to church. And it really was, it was about the somatic experience of your body moving towards the portrait. And then as Toya mentioned, you walked down this kind of lit staircase into the space. Um, Black News had its own moment. It felt like a, a change. And then Hank's Remember Me, when you were standing in the gallery, looking at the portrait, you could see on your sight line, Remember Me, and that was really important to me because at the end, it's like, okay, now what are you gonna do? Never forget. Um, it was difficult for me to have the tables and chairs in there from the beginning. Like early on, I was like, tables and chairs in an exhibition space, what are we doing? Like what? And, but very quickly was like, oh no, this is exactly what we need. But it, at first I wasn't, I, I had some internal hesitancy around including tables and chairs, not the idea of aftercare, but like, is this the right approach? Um, and it was. 
So I'm really glad that I didn't listen to my instincts there and I listened to somebody else's. Thank you. So I'm gonna share a few slides here and just talk through a lot of times people say, what's happening now, right? So you did this big exhibition, we've heard about it. What happens now and does the work stop? Um, but it was really just the beginning. Hang on here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about looking forward, um, where things went, um, how things progress after Promise Witness Remembrance. And so during that space, I was the community engagement strategist and um, shortly after moved into being the director of equity, inclusion and belonging. And so the idea was a lot of the work with community engagement was outside, right? How do we bring voices outside in? How do we bring people that were disengaged, unheard and overlooked into the museum and create a space of belonging, right? Where they can be seen, heard and valued. Um, but much of the work around diversity, equity, inclusion is inside outside, right? Not only are we bringing people in and engaging and informing and interacting, but also how do we change the institutional barriers to keep them from coming back, right? How do we keep them from walking into a space where they're not seen and represented um, and definitely not heard, right? And so one of the things I had mentioned earlier, the research committee. So the foundation for this work was what we call PWR, Power Witness Remembrance. And we said, okay, we have this very eloquent exhibition, right? That pulls people through, um, through a contemporary lens in a lot of way, but how do we get the raw perspective from the community that's unfiltered, that's uncensored, that really can capture people's emotions? And that came from photo voice. And this is, it could have been me. And a lot of times when I would talk to steering committee members, our staff, community, wherever I was talking about Brianna Taylor, they say, well, wait, it could have been me. That No, Brianna Taylor is not some woman. That could have been me. That could have been me in my youth. And that could be me tomorrow, right? So we had to create this um, art engagement that would allow people to respond. And similar to um, Allison, I drew my prompts for It Could Have Been Me from Brianna Taylor's mom, right? And talking to Tamika Palmer and saying, what are the things that um, really are themes around Brianna Taylor's life? And we talked about what is the Black experience? What is Black love? But what does racism look like, right? What is Black family? and what's the Black contribution. And so um, participants would come in for eight weeks and they would have these facilitated discussions and they'd be given a prompt. And each week they would go out and take photographs to respond to that prompt. And this was actually an exhibition that coincided with Promise Witness Remembrance. They were up at the same time. And many people would come in and say, oh, I know that street. Oh, that's my neighborhood. Oh, I ate at that restaurant. So it was another like nod to community. And it was um, an honor, right? Now we're elevating things that are from historically black community, but we're putting it in this regal and um, reserved space, right? That has been traditionally reserved for classic art or fine art. And so I wanted to build on that. After a Promise Witness Remembrance closed, I was really tasked with um, taking in those ideas and feedback that I had gathered from my CERN committee. And we had this project or this activity called the green lighting. And green lighting, you can throw any and everything at the wall and not criticize it as an idea, right? And so we were throwing out ideas around how do we engage around Breonna Taylor and gun violence. And one of the steering committee members, who's now a state representative, said, you know what, Toya, I really wish we could do an art project that allowed us to bring attention to the effects guns had on Black community, right? Not just um, collect specifically for police violence, but collectively, right? Um, and here comes the promise. And then pull that idea of 
what happens when the promise is in balance, right? When, when we're still waiting for that promise to come true and brought in Roberto Fasani. And so the idea behind this was to create this art-based socially engaged research that can one, allow black community to have a frame to speak about gun violence in their words, from their perspective, but also as a container to bring attention to the problem of gun violence in all those facets of how it shows up. We're talking about suicide prevention, right? We're talking about a mental health access. We're talking about lack of resources. We're talking about all of those things that don't come up when we're talking about root causes, but are very much present in that conversation. And so the idea was, let's have this iron for right? Originally thinking that we could actually take guns and melt them, right? We ended up doing it more symbolically, but over a course of um, 12 weeks, Roberto went through a series of um, lessons really talking about the history of guns from Africa to here in the U.S. He talked about um, the relationship that guns had with how we interact with one another, right? That power and control that happens around guns. Um, but also what artists are using guns as material and what artists are using guns as subject matter. And the team had this twofold they were able to respond in photo voice, just like it could have been me, but they also were encouraged to create artwork through an, the iron pour. And this is the promise. And so after the exhibition or the workshop closed, this exhibition opened up um, and actually just closed last week. Um, and the powerful thing about the promise is that eight individuals came um, and participated, each one had their own entry point to gun violence, right? Either through themselves, our family, our community. Some of them might have even been the perpetrators, right, of the gun violence. And we were all able to share where we were in that space, right, to be very vulnerable in ways that we haven't before. Right. I always tell people it's one thing to say, oh, I'm going to come to therapy, right, and talk about trauma and experiences and how it affected me. But it's another to say, okay, let's do some art. Right. And along the way, we're going to share and we're going to support one another and we're going to grow together. And so the latter is a little bit more easy to sell. Right. I can, I can bring you in for some artwork, but I can't always bring in communities that have been um, disengaged, marginalized. Um, are disinvested in a therapeutic space. We just don't trust it. And so this is the um, resulting artwork. As a part of this exhibition, we had three intimate discussions and people from all walks of life came in and talked about racism, right? They talked about um, class and power and um, just how gun violence has affected each and every one of them in different ways. And that's another thing that we could not have planned, right? We couldn't have said people would come in and they would feel comfortable doing this. The artwork brought them there and the artwork created that space. So a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's funny, I wanted to leave off with where we're going now and what I do now. And so you're looking at this beautiful home and people come up to me all the time or in panels or in side conversations. And they'll say, Toya, I mean, I heard you were the director of equity, access and inclusion at the speed. But what does that mean? Like, is that a real job? Or is it like a token job? You know, is it just a job on paper? Like, what do you do? And is the institution really down for it? And so I laugh all the time. I get it so much. It's like, okay, let me give you an example that everyone can kind of relate to. Um, I have a background in design. I know I've lived like nine lives. I'm an artist, I'm a researcher, all these things, but I'm also a designer. Um, and part of that is really understanding the industry. So my job is just like this. I tell people we're gonna build this home. It's gorgeous, we're excited. We picked out the flooring. As you see, it's all finished. We know which room we want. And it's this beautiful picture of what we're gonna walk into. But then when day one starts, 
And I say, come on, let's go to our new house. This is what we enter into, right? This is our dream, but it hasn't been renovated yet. And what does that mean? There's some areas that we haven't even thought of addressing, right? There wasn't a space for it. Maybe there wasn't a budget for it. Maybe there wasn't a person assigned to do that. It could even be desire, right? People and institutions come to this work at different places. And so we have to accept that sometimes we might have to come in and clean some stuff out before we do anything. Or there's some rooms that we've really cultivated that really don't need any care at all. We're just really bringing in new people to inhabit those spaces. And so that's what the work really looks like today, not only in our institutions, but a lot of institutions. We're going up in those attics that people don't go into. We're going up, you know, in those basements, that one room that hasn't been addressed. And we're saying, what is here that doesn't belong, right? Or what is here that has true value that we have been overlooking, right? That we haven't noticed because it was kind of, shoved in that corner, right? And all of us, all of us as community members, as citizens, as cultural creators, as artists, as administrators, we have a part in that, right? Whether you are the person that's physically um, designing the space and creating these ideas, or are you the passerby that says, you know what, it would be beautiful if this space changed, right? And I would see myself going into it. Um, there's two things that really move change, right? Money and pressure. And some of that, that pressure is soft and it comes through raving, but it also can be a soft change, right? And you decide as a person, as an institution, how you want to move forward. I just encourage you to move forward. But how do we do it? We have to do it collectively. Anybody that knows anything about design, there's a lot of people that show up on a redesign or a new house build. There's the homeowners, there's the architect, there's a the contractor. That's me, I'm the lighting designer. There's a kitchen designer, there's an audio visual person. All of those people have a say in what's happening. They're not passive participants. Each one comes with their own skill. Each one comes with their own expertise and we're interdependent on one another. And so this is the same way. We're interdependent on each other as institutions of higher learning, as museums, as schools, um, but we're also interdependent on each other as communities and one cannot grow or develop without the other. And that's where I'll stop there. Hoping we have time for a few questions. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for such a tremendous presentation. That was truly wonderful. And um, yes, we're all doing our silent clapping, but if we're in person, I'm sure the room would just be full. Um, so thank you so much again. Um, please, if anybody was inspired, has any questions, any comments, we would love to hear from you um, in the chat. Um, but maybe to start off, um, my mind is burning with the questions. So I'll just put myself at the top of that list right now. Um, but I guess as somebody who's working in a museum structure, but is historically and traditionally part of a group that, you know, is, is marginalized and excluded from traditional museum um, consideration experiences like both of you were talking about, it, it's very clear that both of you have put, put your, all of your energy consideration intention into really involving the community and then also taking it upon yourself to navigate the museum structure and that heavy weight being on your shoulders. And I'm curious as to how establishing that bridge of trust with the marginalized communities, with yourself and the institution went. And if you think it is possible that that bridge can still exist um, in the future or what requires what maintenance is required for it and either one of you is, uh, if and any of you have a answer for it. Yeah. yeah I think you hit it on the maintenance um it's really about trust building um, I say that we're up against 100 or more years of inequity right it didn't just happen yesterday um, for people of color um, for all people really trauma is embedded in our bodies 
So even when we make those relationships, someone can come into that space and they'll know something of harm happened there, maybe not to them, but generations past, their bodies react and they don't wanna be there. So not only can we build their bridge, but we also have to find ways to counter that. And so that's why when we're doing intentional work, we're recoding that experience, right? We're replacing that trauma or the negative that happened in our past and giving them something new to build on. So next generations can feel something different. That's wonderful, thank you. That, that really resonates and it, it's very inspiring, honestly, to hear both of you speak on the work that you've done um, for me personally, and I'm sure um, our colleagues in the, in the Zoom today. So. Thank you for doing this. It's, uh, I hope that more institutions can follow your lead. Uh, yes, actually, my question is for Allison. And really looking at the overall timeline of the development of the exhibition. I you know historically exhibitions develop over several years. Um, and this was, uh, I think, less than a year. <laughs> um, development. Allison, what were your initial hesitations? And um, I think just um, hesitations, but also motivations to take on this invitation from the Speed Art Museum. It's a really great question. Um, for me, it was personal. Also, um, I have a connection to the story in a way. Um, not, not the particular story of Brianna Taylor, but I have a, a connection and um, desire to, by finding my voice through my own understanding of uh, trauma, I was able to support other people in finding their voices. And so I realized like that is that, is, that was the draw for me um, and that it helped me to find my voice more. And it's something I continue to do. Um, I was actually late to this Zoom because I was on a Zoom with um, Terrence Floyd and a curator who curated an exhibition that is looking at many, many instances of police brutality in the United States. And we're gonna be in conversation next week. And Terrence Floyd is George Floyd's brother. Um, so I, for me, I continue to remain engaged with the subject matter and was, had, was uh, motivated to be engaged because um, I know the power of um, what, you know, Toya brilliantly said, like recoding an experience or supporting um, what it means to be supported to find your voice. And the only hesitation I had was like, how can I make this happen? Because I have a day job. Um, it was really it. It wasn't a question of like, am I going to do this? Um, and the museum I was at graciously um, allowed me to restructure my whole uh, like engagement with them to go to partial time so that I could take this project on. Eventually, actually, the impact of the project was so immense that I decided to depart from the museum I was at, which was just a personal decision. Um, I realized I want that my strengths were working closer to the ground and with diverse communities and my experience with the speed uh, reinforced that. And so now I'm senior curator of a public art organization in New York City where there's no cost, uh, different barriers, but really in public space. And our initiatives are thinking critically about how to continue to engage multiple diverse publics. Um, so, yeah, the only hesitations I, I, I guess I really had were, um, and Amy kept saying, don't say this, uh, were like, can I do this? You know, um, because it was a four month timeline from being invited to opening the show. And actually we pushed it back because it was supposed to open a month earlier, remember Toya? <laughs> I was like, ooh, great. <laughs> it was great. And uh, just the pure intensity of it, knowing that we forfeited all of the holidays, no Thanksgiving, no, no Christmas, you know, we were working through the holidays when everyone else was off, we were working very intensely to get this done and just the pressure of that. And it's um, a very isolating experience because um, we actually didn't have each other as support because we were both in our lanes really pushing things forward. Um, it wasn't to after where you get that relief and you look back and you're like, okay, we were together, but we weren't on that same path. We kind of had to walk that same road 
on different paths until we could merge at the end. That is very powerful. The idea of just committing with like running in parallel lines, but then being able to see that the community actually can be together and still run like that, but we're really like this. Anyway, my analogies if I am. Um, <laughs> I think we have a, a question. We have a couple of questions. Um, so Adam, thank you for putting your question to the chat. Um, Adam's asking how the future looks like and what exhibitions both of you are working on. Okay, well, I'll start. I was looking at Toya to start, but you, it's so hard in a Zoom to look at somebody. <laughs> um, so I can't talk about anything at Public Art Fund because it hasn't been announced, but I can talk about an exhibition I'm working on in St. Louis, um, which is a triennial called Counter Public. And um, I'm working in a neighborhood called St. Louis Place. St. Louis Place is a one mile walk from the former site of Pruitt Igo. And um, the, I'm working with two organizations there. One is the GRIO, which is a 26 year old black history museum um, founder run. And the other one is the Vachon Museum, which is again, like basically I'd say both the directors are curators and they just, they run small house museums. Um, the neighborhood has a low density, it used to be heavily populated, but now there's vast open spaces. Um, the future site of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's campus in Louisville, excuse me, wow, St. Louis, French port cities, St. Louis is directly across the street from um, the Grio. And so developers have been buying up land. Um, and so I am working with four artists. It's also a, now it's a I would say 90% black community. I'm working with four artists um, in this community and with those partners. Um, and so that is coming up April 15th, it'll open. Um, David Ajay, we're realizing his first autonomous public sculpture and it's gonna be permanent. And part of that is about um, pushing back on, you know, land grabbing and development in the community. Um, and Toya, I know you have a ton coming up at the speed. I do. It's interesting. Uh, when the promise closed, people said, what's happening now? And I said, I don't know. You know, I always get the cue from the community, right? And I'm listening for that kind of voice in the back, just like the promise. And so just yesterday, I got a call um, from someone interested in creating the promise this year and really being able to build on um, the mental health aspect of it. And one of the things I didn't mention is that we had... Um, a mental health professional speak with the group. And through that, one of the participants was able to engage in therapy. And that was the first time they had ever considered it. They were actually very opposed to it. And because they were a part of that process, they were able to start unpacking their trauma. So um, looking at that, that's gonna be the opportunity. Um, but the Promise Witness Remembrance Series will keep going. And so this year I decided not to pursue witness. I wanted to give that some time to really sink in what that feels like, what medium speaks to witness. Um, and then that would be that next project after promise. That's beautiful. Thank you. And we're definitely looking forward to the continuation of the series. You'll have to let us know when, <laughs> when witness comes to fruition. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, Carol, our colleague Carol uh, also just shared a question. Uh, for those of us trying to move things forward at other institutions, how do you perceive the role of non-BIPOC curators, other staff in helping to advance these ideas in an equitable and appropriate way? This question is for both of you. I'll go first. Um, I feel like our non-BIPOC um, allies are crucial. Right. Sometimes, um, and you spoke to it, the weight of carrying this work is heavy on your BIPOC community, especially if you have one or two people doing a community engagement or DEI work, or if there's no one specifically assigned to those roles. Um, being educated and informed and being um, a second voice at the table is sometimes the difference in pushing something forward and not right? And so it's easier for someone to understand it if it's not coming from the person experiencing it, right? It kind of people see it as a bias. But if you can come through and one, educate yourself on maybe the collective issues that are happening around the community, 
um, other ways of approaching it, um, or even just being self-reflective. Because I think we don't talk about that enough. We think that it's just uh, something that white people do. White people need to be reflective because, you know, you're biased, but all of us carry biases, right? Because that's the world that we are navigating through. That's the world that we were created in. And so we have to know where is our place in the barriers? Am I part of the barrier? And am I in the way of progress and change? And that's something we all have to collectively do often. This is such a great answer. I, all I'm gonna add is um, uh, sometimes I think really listening to the people in the positions who are making change and trusting also um, their instincts when it comes to a lot of like external affairs, like marketing, communications, development, you know, um, if you are approaching these kinds of external engagements um, with this, you know, the same methodology for everything, um, you're probably not going to get the same results. So really leaning into and trusting your colleagues who are suggesting, uh, you know, ways forward for um, results that might be different. Um, and, and understanding that there can be just like Toya said, many different positions we come from and many different biases, like there are many different ways to, to see something through. And just because an organization has done it one way, doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. Yeah, that was brilliant. So true. Yeah. Really allowing that voice and also the step forward, step back, you know, sometimes you need to push these people out for it that may be quiet in the back of the room, but have a lot to say. And if you're vocal, maybe allowing them to have that platform. And like Allison said, trusting those people of color to, you know, lead you to a different path that's different. It's scary sometimes because it is different. Change is frightening and a little intimidating sometimes. Thank you. And I think it um, really pairs nicely with Toya. I think you you mentioned earlier, magic happens through the tension, mm -hmm. right? So um, definitely taking on um, those words and hopefully everyone here today uh, takes, you know, those steps towards that tension, towards change, towards, you know, reframing the institution and how we can approach uh, exhibitions in, through a collective lens. So thank you. I, I know we are, right on time. So I want to take this moment to thank Allison and Toya. Thank you so much for your time today, for your generosity. Um, Mariama, I don't know if you want to share. Just to, just to echo Delia Sophia, thank you both so much. I am beyond inspired. I feel just very grateful that we were able to hear both of you speak in such depth about a very important um, step in our current world. So thank you both very much um, for joining us today. And thank you everybody for joining us as well. So take care, have a nice rest of your week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much.